Welcome to the How Did You podcast. Today we're joined by John Costa, the documentarian for the Doc Media Centre, as well as the university lecturer. You've done a lot of things. How did you get into what you currently do? Yeah, a bit of a circuitous route, really, which is, is quite interesting because, uh, I mean, I stood at the front today doing the Creative Media Entrepreneurship, which of which you were, you were a student last year, just talking about, you know, being in business and teaching at the university. When I'm not teaching, I'm kind of in business. So it's actually quite a good module for me to be able to teach. So, I mean, I don't have any sort of formal qualifications beyond two A levels, which for geography and geology from a, for a boy from the East End was quite strange. So, yeah, there be mountains, good grief. How did they get there type stuff? And I was always interested in traveling the world um you know national geographics which i'm surrounded by here which was how we found out about the world before the internet so i always knew i would get into doing something that was probably not round there so when i left after a levels i didn't want to go to university absolutely convinced i didn't want to do that all my mates went off i mean um i'd always harbored dreams of being in the army or serving in the military in some way and traveling um and kind of got into scuba diving went into the territorial army and was working in an office at the same time, probably burning the candles at all ends and in the middle. And, and that kind of really got me on that career of doing lots of different things. Um, but the most important one, I guess, is being able to be my own boss and, 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 and you know, make those decisions that I wanted to make about the things that I think are important, which can go against working for other people. But then again, you, you, it, it, with experience, I guess you get to teach at the university without any formal experience because or any formal qualifications because you've got the industry experience. I see that you worked in many different roles, quality assurance as a marketing consultant, brand uh, branch manager in Cambridge. What made you then get contracts with like British Telecommunications, Channel 4 and things like that? What made that change happen? Are you looking at my LinkedIn profile? That's all lies. No, um, <laughs> so I, guess, I guess the thing is, I think because I was always into, I like starting things. I like coming up with ideas, being um, the person that gets it off the ground against all odds, you know, low resources, probably no funding, which has been the detrimental part of my career as well as a success. Um, whereas Tina says I'm not a complete a finisher, which I always feel is a little bit like saying, well, you never like finishing things, which is true but not being a complete finisher actually just makes it sound very formal and quite horrible and a, a quite a bad thing. So it's quite funny, really, when people come to me, can I have an extension? And I go, well, probably would you probably do, because I would need one as well. So um, <laughs> that's quite an interesting conversation with someone. But for me, I think it was always very much is I get bored very quickly. So therefore, I like to have either lots of things on the go or things that I know that are quite short. And of course, for some people, they absolutely hate that. Um, it's quite funny actually my eldest son's completely opposite of that um, he likes to know what he's doing every day you know what I mean structure like that whereas my youngest son has gone into the army as well and he's absolutely loving the kind of the free style not not knowing what's going on today kind of mm. side of it so I guess I'm somewhere in the in in the middle of, of that um, and so yeah it's always being driven by project work um, the work for BT was always doing specific contracts as, as, as a temp, so between traveling, you know, between trips with the army, between you know, expeditions. Um, and I think I worked for the Independent on Sunday and I built the first ever CD database of the first year of the premierships statistics. Now that sounds much better when I say it <laughs> than actually doing it. But, you know, you think like, so I always like doing things that were slightly different. You know what I mean? So when everyone else has said I've worked at an office nine to five, I had to be doing something that was nine to five, but that they were all jealous of. Yeah. If I'm very honest about that, that's exactly what it was. It was I got bored easily and I needed projects and I needed things to stimulate me when I wasn't traveling or doing the things that I really wanted to be doing. You speak of projects and traveling, but one that's very close to you, but is still a project was Citizen's Eye. How did that come around? Because obviously that's in Leicester where you're currently based, mm. but it was kind of a forerunner of what was around at the time. How did it happen? 
Uh, again, very, being very honest with you, Taylor, I think, um, you know, maybe make, make more, more confessional this. I feel, I, feel like, I feel like you should uh, be wearing a white collar for this. Um, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of project work uh, in and around uh, the city and, the, and ca- the county and got in with some people that probably the right sort of people you should be hanging out with. Um, now, whatever they were up to, that wasn't what I was involved in, but I was in the sort of doing additional stuff when it came to writing business plans, businesses they were going to set up and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, so, you know, nightclubs and, you know, di- lots of different things, n- not county lines. I wasn't planning county lines, but, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, if that's what they were up to. I just kind of just ignored it. They, they, they paid me occasionally and it just meant that I got, um, I got paid to make that extra money. You know, I had a young family at the time. And as with all of these things, and I've been bankrupt a couple of times, um with like you know, focusing on doing the stuff that i'm good at and the creative and not being very good at the finance which is quite funny now because when i said to the guys this morning in the module you know what i mean i'm i'm the absolute expert in telling you you should pay an accountant because they know what they're talking about um but you've got to understand the basics i think when you are not responsible for everything and you're responsible for a certain part it's very easy for people to rip you off because they know that you know you're committed to an idea and a project and you're working hard and stuff like that so it was bankrupt a couple of times and then um got into a situation basically i couldn't get out of and went to prison for three months and i swore that when i went to prison then for that three months that when i came out i'd never work for anybody again um and you know trust me you get trust issues in that kind of situation because you know you're there because of a set of circumstances that other people have done um, and you get put in a situation where you have to decide, you know, are you going to be a grass? Um, and, you know, which for some people is tell the truth about the other person, or are you going to like, you know, well, you know, if you do that, then you, you never get away from it then. So I just kind of kept still, took my punishment, and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm learning a really important lesson here. Tough lesson to learn on everybody else around me, um, family and stuff, um, lots of kind of issues, um, you know some of them that are still around still around today like you know people losing houses and stuff like that you know broken marriages but i think you know you learn something from that you know there's no you can't escape four walls and bars on your window to kind of soul search i guess and that was back in uh, 2007 and really when i was in there i actually planned um citizens eye which was a community news agency based here in leicester for people of um, faith or no faith, a demographic group or a geographic area to come together and just share their news. So it wasn't about positive news. Uh, it wasn't hyper-local. It wasn't driven by postcodes, a street or whatever. It was for all people from all of those issues to come together and talk about things that were important to them, societal issues. And it went from Citizens Eye, the main news agency uh, with a website. And uh, the guy who built that website for me now has just built a Parallel Lives website because we're still friends. And he built it for me for free because he said, look, I still understand what you're trying to do. And maybe we'll touch on that later. And we ended up with 20 other news agencies. I'm 19. There was 20 in total. We had a young person's one, old person's one, mental health, homelessness, ex-offenders, obviously. Um, and I had six desks in the Leicester Mercury newsroom. I had a page every week in the Mercury for a community, as branded a citizen's eye for community news. I actually got paid for doing that as well, which was quite rare in those days. This was like 2008 to 2014. Um, we had a young person's newspaper, Tina and I, my partner, for two years, 16 page pullout newspaper every month in the Leicester Mercury, written, sourced, and edited by young people. Still the only one that's ever been done with a bit of lottery funding. And with so it was very much around, yeah, it was very much around. Um, helping other people to tell their story, you know, owning and shaping your own narrative. Now you've got to understand that when I registered for like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and <laughs> Flickr, uh, yeah. Flickr, the photo thing in 2009, most people didn't know what they were. By 2014, having done Citizens Eye for a couple of years and done training at the BBC in the College of Journalism room here in Radio Leicester, um, and done training in various locations, that we'd been made the beacon hub of citizens journalism by the Media Trust, um, which was quite, quite good. Because I said at the time, I don't think I really deserve that award um, because I like this person's newspaper up in you know, Manchester and I like this person's radio station here and their YouTube channel is much better. And the guy said to me, no, 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 you don't understand. I've spoken to all of those people and they're all jealous about how you engage your volunteers every Tuesday for a half an hour in a community news cafe, which I ran basically for 
for seven years. Every Tuesday in three different coffee shops, we burnt out and uh, not burnt down, burnt out because they, they, <laughs> they all shut, they all shut, yeah. And um, so, yeah, I think, and it got to 2014 and more people were then doing their own thing. You know, we're, not, we, not we trained everybody, I don't mean it from that perspective, but more people were getting to grips with Facebook groups and Facebook pages, understanding how to use Twitter, particularly here locally as a, as a, a way of sharing news and stuff like that and hashtags. So I just thought, well, actually, I'm going to stop doing it because, to be honest with you, it's me stopping it rather than me losing it. Um, and so really, I thought long and hard about the bits out of it that I really enjoyed the most, uh, which is watching documentaries. I'm an enthusiastic amateur that just happened to set up a documentary film festival in Leicester for a couple of years at the Phoenix. Um, and specialised in taking screenings out to local uh, coffee shops. I've, been, I've done stuff in Black Sports Shop. I've done things in like, you know, Timberland Shop in the High Cross, lots of community settings and libraries that actually the documentary side of it was what I really enjoyed. So I thought, well, actually, if I close that, then maybe I can start the Documentary Media Centre. And it's a natural evolution of then taking that documentary film photography, audio and new media, that kind of documentary media, as I call it, and kind of put myself at the intersection, which is a bit of a trendy word now, but it wasn't at the time. Um, put yourself at the intersection of this kind of solutions journalism as well, you know, so people giving platforms to people that were solving the problem rather than keep writing about the problem. You know what I mean? I know there's global change or climate war, climate change, whatever, who's doing something about it, you know? So um, I always get sort of warm, fuzzy feelings when I see people that are doing things now and they go like, you know, would you like to be involved? And I'm like, no, I don't want to be involved, but let me be an enthusiastic supporter of what you do. Because I, it, I just think, I just get tired thinking about how exhausting it was. I'm an old man now at 55, so I kind of, I, I kind of pick my battles now. You talk about the fact that you've created communities and cafes, then gone online and done loads of big, like, days i've seen you've done 24 hour streams really long streams for quite good purposes which one's the one that sticks out in your head is there a particular one or is it a kind of category of streams because obviously we've been in lockdown and you turned the doc media center from kind of an open all day kind of thing into a broadcast room for loads of different kind of streams is there one that sticks out that's a good question actually um I think also, again, just going back to some negative stuff, you know what I mean? I've organised quite a lot of events that have been absolute 125% abject failures with very little attendance or none at all, you know? And, uh, and I'll tell you what, there's nothing worse than an empty room when you put a lot of effort into putting up an exhibition or got a guest talk uh, or a guest speaker that's come a long way and so you're paying for them. So I think because... I tend to not look at them as failures, but more sort of learning experiences. Otherwise, you just cry your eyes out all day, wouldn't you? So you look at look back at all your learning experiences. And what it makes you realise is that the size of an audience does not make the event. Now, you know, I know so many people would turn around and say, well, you know, it was an absolute failure. You know, not every seat was sold and all this sort of stuff. And I guess I don't go too hard on people when, they, when they're like that because they're still buying into that function that, you know, lots of people make an event when in fact, you know, it's people that wanting to be there make the event. So I always came here from the point of view that when I used to run month long documentary media months, I think sort of 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, I think in November, again, which was one of the months that I was in prison. So I used to kind of create this as an artificial way of going crazy for a month. Um, you know, really late nights and stuff, just not, not partying, but just kind of working really hard for a month, almost like to, catch up I guess on sort of that November that I wasted by being in prison um that you suddenly realize I think my average was something like 14 people across the 100 events that I ran all of which were free and you think okay so you start thinking about then who's your audience out of those 14 what were there well there was a sprinkling of academics and there were a sprinkling of students and there were a sprinkling of kind of issue experts people that knew things or you know had experienced it and then, and then a sprinkling of the engaged public, you know, those that had moved beyond the like button on Facebook actually wanted to do something. And so that's really kind of when I looked at this building, which is quite small in its kind of four rooms, there were five rooms that we've got, they're quite small, really. I'd gone from thinking I need a big space to a space that I can use that you could fit 
between six and 12 people in at any one time. Um, and COVID came along and obviously we had this massive summer, summer of programs, summer of documentary lined up. Um, and Tina said, well, we're just going to have to turn it inside out, you know what I mean, and start broadcasting. And of course, you know, I'd never heard of Zoom on the day of lockdown um, because, you know, it was, it was Skype or nothing. And teaching at the uni for a couple of years, it was, you know, Teams or, you know, um, <laughs> Google Hangouts or something, you know. So suddenly, you know, now you, your grand uses Zoom, you know, and everybody uses Zoom. But it's how you, I think Zoom now is a little bit like Twitter mm. of its day. You know, now people, I don't use Zoom anymore. So what, they're the ones that don't use Twitter. It's like, are you using Zoom to help people? And I think my boys still laugh at me that I'm, you know, that I'm quite proactive on Facebook. But I don't put anything up about them or my life or what I'm interested in or Tina or, or here. It's all relating to issues and stuff. And then only because all of the people that we deal across the sort of global south, over 118 countries of the Parallel Lives Network, Facebook to them is still, you know, the internet. Um, and and we, won't, we won't go on about Facebook too much, but I'm saying, you know, it's something that, you know, when you can get your mobile phone in South Asia that comes preloaded with Facebook and as long as you don't go outside that you don't pay charges, do you think, well, that, you know, it, it is kind of running the world from that perspective, not maybe here, but certainly there. And I think that's one of the things that for me was always about if I was going to do an event in lockdown, it had to be something again back to that you know i need to be first i need to be doing it bigger i need to be doing it differently well let's run a couple of 24-hour newsrooms which then completely blows people's minds because the first thing they say to you is like well when are you going to go asleep and then you go well i'm not and they're like well i'm going to watch just to see if you fall asleep you know so there's all these people looking at you waiting for you like, you're like this trying to like keep your eyes open yeah um and it, it just anything that got people to think that was great and that's really where the parallel lives network came from it was the formalization that you know all of these people around the world that would talk to me about global issues and what they were doing you know the media documentary um you know whether that's human trafficking whether that's domestic violence you know sexual violence exploitation whatever it is all of these societal issues that we focus on here um then tina said well look you know if they're happy to do it every couple of months for a 10-hour newsroom or 24-hour newsroom maybe we should be giving something back to them with that structure, which is about, you know, once a month, we now we do a network bulletin, we help them share news, you know, write funding bids, um, show, give them some training opportunities that they ask us for, you know, but then we facilitate people to come and help us. So former students, you know, I have a, I have a former student from last year who comes in every Monday and does his own thing, but then gets involved in projects for us. Mohammed built my website again, he's, he's moved from being in Leicester, um, young Somalian guy, you know, living in St. Matthews and, uh, and, and here he is, you know, married in, in Morocco and uh, still doing stuff on the web, building websites for me, for, for, for clients in, in Iraq where I'm doing some, doing some work. And then he said, well, I'll build your Parallel Lives Network for you for free because I still believe in what you were doing from the, the day I, I bumped into you and we were chatting about what you wanted to do with Citizens Eye, you know? And I think for me, that's the power of networking. It's getting people to understand, you know, it's, it's not, you know, what qualifications you've got or how much money you've got it's it's the people that you know and the people that you trust you talk about how you've reinvented yourself from prison to a doc media center to them reinventing the doc media center essentially into the paralyzed parallel live network if you had to reinvent yourself once more and you had to go into a place where you've not been yet where would that be it's a good question i wouldn't use the term reinvent i'd say change because that terrifies people because actually reinventing means everything's wrong. Whereas, it, you know, so you need to create something new. Whereas to change means that you need to look hard and long at yourself or your business or what you're doing or your relationships or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Even, even having the courage as a guy did last week to change after one week of doing the module with me to decide he doesn't want to set his own business up now. Maybe you should do another module. That takes a lot of courage to do that. You know, so for me, it's about, being willing to change for me i think there's one more change left in me probably is the way that i would uh, would come at that and do you know what i'm pretty happy with who i am that that is a fundamentally flawed 55 year old gray-haired old man um who has you know life ain't all sunshine and rainbow so i have to agree with rocky from rocky four five or six whatever that was um <laughs> still one still one of the best motivational species on, on youtube um, through to 
knowing what I want to do when I left school, maybe. Um, you know, I, I do enjoy showing people that little um, that little cartoon that's always like someone at the start line and the finish line, and there's someone next to them who's gone through water, over barbed wire, through fire, through explosions. That's that is life, not this straight line. And I'd always say that everybody that I've ever come across who's been on an extremely straight line where everything's just fallen into place for them, the first time they fall over and scrape their knee, they've got no resilience to to change. Um, so, you know, you've got to experience what it's like to fall off a bike and scratch your knee for you to know it. I appreciate you can watch it on tech decks or watch someone talking to you or unboxing uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 the plasters to put on your leg because they've just fallen off the bike on YouTube. But I think we need to build a little bit more resilience into what the Internet's for and how we can use it in real life um, and marry those two worlds, not having two separate worlds, but how do we use the virtual world to support what we do in real life? Because ultimately, that's we don't want to hide there. We want to kind of improve where we are. Um, so for me, I think I won't change anymore. I think that the change that I needed was the change that I had 13 years ago because I would have carried on making the same mistakes. Now, if I learned from those mistakes, sometimes I don't think I have. Um, when something doesn't quite work out or you know, someone gets under your radar again and someone does something and you think, oh, you know, it's, but that's life, you know what I mean? Um, you've, you've, got to, you've got to be in the game to score the goal. You know what I mean? Now, no one ever won anything from standing on the sidelines, you know, giving encouragement and stuff like that. You've got to be in there, you know what I mean? And that's why I always admire people that take penalties and then when they miss the rest of their life, you know, people will always remember them by that, you know what I mean? Then to get up every day and function as a human being after that kind of failure, I can appreciate that because I know what that was like, you know, going to prison, thinking, you know, while you're in here for three months, you're thinking about everybody's talking about you. And then when you come out, everybody's talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> and you've kind of walked down the street now and every now and again, I walk down the street now and see a few people and they kind of look at you and they know who you are from, from that, from those days. And you just have to, well, what are you going to do? You're going to hide away or you, or you're going to get on and, because the best way to answer your critics or your detractors and all that sort of stuff is, is not to get in any kind of verbal confrontation with them. It's just to be a success because you were always right with what you were trying to do. So you, 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 the module tutor on creative entrepreneurship and the um, module leader for communication arts, how did you manage to get into DMU after all of this? Was it through a friend? Was it through a job post or was it something completely new? That's a good question, actually. That's a very good question, um, which actually most, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that, actually. Yeah. Um, they don't know who I am. I'm just pretending like, you know, I mean, <laughs> Stockholm Syndrome. No, um, Dr. Rob Watson. Uh, who used to work at De Montfort University uh, had supported quite a lot of the stuff that I'd done with Citizens Eye, particularly some events at the uh, College of Journalism at the BBC Radio Leicester here. And he was doing a PhD at the time, which is behind me on the shelf, a nice weighty tome. Um, when I need to get up to the top of the shelves, I stand on it and I can reach the top. <laughs> I always say that to him. Nine years of work, I can reach something on the top shelf. Thanks, Rob. And... Uh, <laughs> they had created a new course called communication arts and he'd case studied citizens eye in his phd has had three other people so in fact currently i'm in four different phds um without a degree which i'm quite proud of to be honest i've even done anything that's worth academically looking at from left or right and he'd created a course called communication arts and they had first years and he said would you come and talk to them and I think at the time, there were like six or seven of them. Um, and it was a new degree that they picked, uh, had launched. So I did that. And then the following year, he said, um, would you like to come and run the lab sessions? Because they'd gone into year two. I think, they'll think by that time, I think there was four of them, four or five of them. And then they got a new group of first years. Would you like to come in and run for the first years and the second years, um, the labs? You know what I mean? The sort of the, the, the sort of two hour lab every yeah. week. So that was four hours teaching, two labs, first year and second year. And then the following year, um, I think Rob uh, took redundancy. And then they said, do you want to be module leader? And I'm like, you do know I'm not an academic, didn't you? 
And they were like, oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> you, you're good at what you do. So, mm-hmm. Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what they told me. I don't know if that's true. I'm, I'm still, I'm, yeah. I guess I'm still there, aren't I? Um, I'd agree. <laughs> thank you. That's very nice of you. I'll send you the money. Um, <laughs> and so I think I ran the lectures and the labs for all three year groups. So by this time, there were three guys yeah. who had gone into the third, third and final year. There were second years and first years. I ran that. And I think also that year, there was a vacancy was not even a vacancy i guess there was a need for someone to do um social media practice in third years i think also with when when i was doing stuff with rob i'd also run some social media stuff in first years he did the lecture and i did the labs yeah um and then i did third year media production social media practice and i did that for two years um and then last year simon asked me to to do um to do creative media entrepreneurship with him so this is the second year of doing that. So I think this is my fifth year of teaching. Um, my sixth year with my guest lectures for the first years on their own, but my fifth year of actually being a module leader, deputy program leader of Com Arts, and um, you know being a module tutor with Creative Media Entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, so. I bet when you were in the army, you never expected to be working at a university. No, well, um, I think I think actually time. my parents are probably prouder than me of, of the fact that I'm now, um, you know, a, a permanent member of staff at, at DMU. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure. They're, they're quite elderly, bless them. And I lost their house when I went to prison. So, you know, what I mean, there's this and they live with me now. So there's never not a reminder of it. But I think they're probably quite proud of the fact that, that I teach at the university. And I think also because I rejected the whole concept of what that stood for when i was younger and went off you know and did stuff with the army and traveled around the world on expeditions and stuff and organized lots of things nationally like swimathon and you know what i mean london youth games and got involved in all that kind of stuff that i'd never really gave it any kind of thought and then it presented itself to it and i'd be honest i'll be honest with you mate this morning between 9 and 11 when i was running a lab if someone had come in and gone are you john costa are you meant to be here I probably would have gone fair cop, mate. You know what I mean? You got me. <laughs> so when I've got students that talk to me about Stockholm syndrome, you know what I mean? I always say to them, you know, that kind of, oh, imposter syndrome, you know, that kind of, should you be here? And I said, it's all about confidence. You know, you just have to believe that you're there, that you're, you've got your, the best intentions in place and then people will do it. And, and so I get quite frustrated with people when they say like, Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I go, well, from what you're saying is you don't want to do it. You're not telling me you can't do it because anybody can do it because what one i'm living proof of it but also if you put the hard work in and the effort to do it and the thing is of course what that means is as a non-academic there are a, a completely different set of challenges for you to be able to survive because you can't get past on your cheeky chappiness alone you know what i mean you've still got to do all the marking and the grading and create module handbooks and stuff so that's the stuff that i have to kind of push myself to but you know that's what it's about you speak about how you've had a partner throughout this, John. How did you meet Tina and what is Tina's role through the Duck Media Centre? I think I'd been out of uh, um, the kitchen. We call it the kitchen now. We went, on a, we went on a trip once to Germany on the Rhine and we were in this hotel and the guy was giving us a bit of a, a talk about the area. And he said, over there, you know what I mean, um, is like the prison for... It, where this part of the Rhine is he said and whenever husbands went over there the, the wives would say how's your husband getting on in the kitchen so of course I walk past Welford Road every day so like, whenever Tina says where are you I'm walking in I say I'm walking past the kitchen so yeah um I'd not long come out the kitchen and yeah. um and I think I was in voluntary action Leicester to get some advice about setting citizens eye up you know I was in that early days you know what I mean think, thinking that I needed any kind of help not that I ever listened to what anybody ever said to me. I just always did my own thing. But I guess yeah. I was pretending, trying to, trying to be a different version of John Costa by pretending that I would listen to any kind of advice that anyone gave me. Well, that was very honest then. I was very honest then. Oh, good grief. <laughs> when Tina listens to this, she's going to laugh her head off. Um, oh, my God. And uh, I told you this would be like therapy, didn't I? And, <laughs> and I think I've always, been, I've always been inspired by Tina's work ethic when it comes to her commitment to young people particularly mm-hmm. um and you know where she's from where she grew up you know sort of council estate like i did you know and wanting to help people you know what i mean people that don't normally get access to things you know because people think you're this you're that and that kind of stuff you know and 
I think, you know, working with Tina, you know, when we did the young people's newspaper, just to see her passion and her commitment to that. And when we had the Watt space, a, a shop at the High Cross for four years, you know, getting Leicester College students in doing shops and stuff and just just the look on people's faces when they're absolutely mortified that you've just given them permission to have an exhibition on their own and they never thought they would because they're from le3 you know um yeah. that for me i think is one of the greatest things about working with tina is that every day is different um here she's you know really pushes the social media side um can, can create a document like a, you know a community communications plan for someone like that She's already created it in her head before she's even written it and you're still in the meeting. You can see it sometimes like, you know, if someone asks me a question, yeah, I'm answering the question, but you can hear and see the heat coming off of Tina's head because she has already ma mapped it out. And then I've learned to turn around and answer their question, but not trying to give them any kind of suggestion about how we're going to deliver it. Because I know whatever I say, she's going to come in and go, we're not doing that. We're going to do, <laughs> we're going to do this. And then, she'll come up with a structure and then I'll end, you know, I'll deliver it, you know? So um, I think a lot of people think that when we do these newsrooms and I'm doing a lot of the interviews and talks and stuff like that, all of the social media behind it and all of the outreach and all of the good feedback that we get post the, the event is all based on the, 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 the incredible work and statistics and, you know, reports that Tina's very good at bringing together. So from that point of view, I think we're quite good. Now, you know, neither of us is uh, particularly bothered about who's steering the ship. I would rather be steering it, but occasionally, like I don't always get to steer the ship, you know. But yeah, I'm glad she's not here because she'd be shouting out from the other room now. <laughs> <laughs> you've been through a lot, and you've clearly had a lot of experience. You've given a lot of feedback. You've maybe taken feedback. I'm not too sure. <laughs> oh yes, is... I'm very, I'm very good at taking feedback, man. <laughs> um, what is the one kind of bit of advice you'd give to new people within the media or people that are just starting out? Don't try and invent something new. Find, find where the opportunities are to make money. Um, I think that's one of the, I, I've spent far too long with not the necessary background, resources, connections, finance, equipment to be the first person to do something. And I've done a lot of innovative work now that people have taken either deliberately or, um, through osmosis you know what i mean because they're around and they see it being done i made a lot of money out of it it doesn't really bother me to be honest i'm just not motivated by money at all i mean i don't have a car any of that kind of stuff it just it's, it's they're, they're things they're material things you know i get more pleasure out of helping people and seeing the looks on people's faces when they suddenly realize that they don't need anyone's permission to do what they want to do you know to own and shape their own narrative tell their own story because if they don't no one else will um so I'm not kind of driven by, I'm not kind of driven by that. So for me, it's about giving people the courage, helping them to have the courage to, to believe that they, that they are good enough to be able to do something. Yeah. That's the, I think that's, that's the greatest gift. I mean, if, if that's, if that was money, if it suddenly wasn't money and someone said, you know, it's a toss up between shirt buttons and, you know, putting a smile on people's faces then I think, you know, I'm probably already very wealthy. So, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite content from that point of view. Okay. That's some really good advice because obviously you're a great fan of documentary and you created the DocuFilm Festival and kind of ran alongside that. How did you kind of create that? And what is your kind of biggest memory around it all? I think one of the, 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 the reason behind doing it was the fact that um, I knew people were talking about doing it, but were always coming from the point of view of they'd need money to do it. And that really, really pissed me off <laughs> because I've been in so many situations around the world where the, where people have nothing, you know what I mean? And they do something. Uh, and that's why I think I, I probably, you know, only work in low resource settings now with people that are, you know, not wealthy and all that sort of stuff. I guess also it just means you don't have to waste your time having the conversation about money because it's just not an issue for anybody. So therefore let's get on and do something that needs doing. And if it's good, I guess, well, the, the money will find us. Um, and that's what I did with the Doc Film Festival, um, you know, and took a space locally that I completely tra transformed. To this day, it's never looked like that. And I was really proud of that. You know what I mean? Um, 
I don't. I, I think it took me a number of years to get over what had happened to me because I was constantly trying to be seen to have be different, you know, or, or doing more. And that's changed over the years. I've got a lot calmer about that now to the point where now it's just, I just do what I think is right, whether people agree with me or not. <laughs> oh, my, oh my God. <laughs> you know I mean? How about you delete all this and we start again? Like, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll just put this into my speech that I play to my funeral. Yeah. And we'll do a completely different podcast where I just very motivational and give lots of good advice. You've gr- given some great advice. But <laughs> Hopefully. Obviously, that film festival isn't the only one that you've been involved with. You've been involved with the SDG Film Festival, which I actually had a submission in last year. How did you get involved with that? Because that's quite an interesting topic because it's kind of reflected on what's actually happening around the world, which is something that you've always been kind of moving around on and always had your finger in the pie, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, just to come, come back to something I said previously, because it is relevant, is I think when I came out of, um, when I came out of the kitchen, you, know, you have to listen to earlier in the podcast in case you've just joined it, you know what I mean, to know where the kitchen is. But it was always about having something to aim for. So when I came out in 2008, I picked tw- London 2012, the Olympics, as something to aim for for four years. So we did a lot of stuff around the Special Olympics in 2009 in Leicester. We set out to train 2012 community reporters for 2012, and that failed miserably. But, you know, it, it was an admirable aim at the time. Got people into the cafe every Tuesday. Um, And it was always about just trying to have things that you aimed for. So I always did things like, you know, documentary media month was the idea of 30 days, 100 free events, something to aim for every November. So I always have to have something to aim for. And the um, sustainable development goals, we'd already done some stuff around the millennium development goals from 2000 to 2015. So when they came along 2015 to 2030, it was just something to like hook conversations with people on because for the first time, you could talk about the sustainable development goals from your perspective in Leicester with no poverty, of which we've got quite a lot, particularly child poverty, um, with someone in Bangladesh with their version of what no poverty was, you know, whatever their aspirations were around the goal. So it was, for me, it was a great equaliser. You could talk to people about that. And so Dr. Ben Harbisher, who runs the, the SDG Film Festival, said to me, um, because I'm a member of the Media Discourse Centre as well, which is run by Professor Stuart Price at DMU, you know, are you interested in being involved, you know, giving a couple of, you know, guest speaks, uh, talks and stuff like that? And I said, well, actually, I'm quite up for sponsoring an award. So I think I've sponsored a reward for the last two uh, festivals uh, called the Showcase Award. So I I try to pick my, my, um, my documentary winner. It's always very different from what anybody else would pick because then I interview them after, you know, I put their interview in the section for the country. So Indonesia this time, and uh, it was Cambodia before, have a copy of the film, you know, put it out on social media and stuff like that. And just try to encourage the young people to keep making documentaries about societal issues, not just because it was part of their module to submit to a festival. And so I, that, that's the reason. I think I'm talking to the same university on Friday in Indonesia, for 45 minutes about the the parallel lives network and networking and you know finding really good stories on your doorstep you don't have to get on an airplane and things like that you know the stuff's around you don't realize because if you capture what's around you yeah you're actually helping someone who can't get on the plane to come and make that documentary Mm -hmm. so you know from the pandemic's point of view it's if that's kind of tempered our ability to travel or our want to travel because we don't want to, you know, greenhouse gases and climate change and stuff. So therefore it's try and be an early innovator and an early adopter of getting quite good at making documentaries about where you are and, and sharing that and then building connections with different people where you can have connections about, you know, what's it like where you are, this is what it's like where I am. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've been lectured in lots of universities across the world, mate, you know, when you've got an 18, 19, 20 year old in front of you, and they're no different from the students that you've taught before, because all they're interested in really at that age is fashion, music, falling in love, you know, getting their parents off their back, maybe thinking about work, falling in love, coffee, you know what I mean? So it's all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, maybe I should say sex. I showed, showed my age there by saying love, didn't I? Yeah, thinking, about, <laughs> thinking about sex, you know. Um, courting. You know, courting, stepping out. Yeah, stepping out. Yeah, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. I think that 
because I always say to people, you know, why don't you like North Koreans? You've never met one. Yeah, you know, true. I do a lot of work in Iraq. You know, why don't you like Iraqis? We've, you've never met one. Why don't you like gypsy travelers? You've never met one. Why don't you like African Caribbeans? You've never actually had a conversation with one. And you can get people to suddenly understand the media has such an incredible power over who we like and dislike for no other reason than we've not had that experience ourselves. So most of that courage comes to put yourself in the situation where you can have a conversation with someone from, from that particular tribe, gender, you know what I mean? So that kind of stuff. And just, and just challenge yourself, you know, to be a grown up and, you know, make up that decision yourself because you're not 10, you know, when you're 10, you're expecting to be told what to do. When you're 15, you don't like being told what to do. Now, why as an adult, are you just taking the fact that the reason we're bombing the shit out of these people is because we don't like them. You know what I mean? And it's, it's stuff like that, you know? You talk about making decisions for yourself. Has there ever been a decision that you've regretted? Particularly, has there ever been someone that's come to you with a proposal and, and you've rejected it because maybe, I don't know, the funds weren't high enough and you thought it wasn't worth it? Has it kind of kind of bitten you in the back and you've kind of gone, I wish I'd done that? No. Any, anything that I don't do now is based on that experience 13 years ago, which is if it doesn't feel right, then it's not right. You know what I mean? And rightly or wrongly, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If someone then takes that opportunity and makes it a success, that doesn't mean it was going to be a success for you. Okay. Yeah. Because I think, you know, all of that sort of, you know, all, all, all your ducks have got to be in a line, whatever you want to say, you know what I mean? All the planets have got to be aligned. You know what I mean? If your head and your heart and your common sense and your logic and the hairs on the back of your neck and your goosebumps are not all in line, then, you know, it's not going to be for you. You know, so I've, I've taken a lot of bad advice and I've ignored a lot of good advice. And the one thing I would say to people, and this is normally what I say about the media, actually, but this is actually probably as much about people. It's about, you know, who do you trust to tell you the truth? You know, and it takes a lot of effort to surround yourself, even if it's one person. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, surround doesn't mean it needs to be lots, but, you know, people that you trust, that you tell things to, that you take honest criticism from, um, that you ask for advice, um, particularly if you know the answer is not one you're going to want to hear. Sometimes you need a friend that you turn around and go, you think I should be doing that? And they like, they go like, no, yeah. <laughs> but if they know you well enough, they'll turn around and say, but you've already made that decision yourself. You're just asking me for confirmation. You know what I mean? So, but again, that's, that's one of those things, isn't it? You know, with, with age comes wisdom, hopefully. And, you know, youth is wasted on the young. Youth is wasted on the young because, you know, you tend to make a lot of mistakes. Whereas when you get older, would you, would you go back and do it again? Of course I would. You know what I mean? You, you, how can you turn around and go, I'd go back and do it differently? You're up, you're up yourself. You know what I mean? You, you've got one chance. You get to the crossroad once. Whatever decision you make, you've got to live with the decision, you know, good or bad. And if you survive making that decision by going left or right, I guess that also comes something very pragmatic that I learned in the army, which is if we sit here, we're all going to die anyway. So we might as well go left or right or straight up the middle. I'd much rather, you know, it not work going forward rather than sitting it going like, oh, it was so-and-so's fault. If only this, if only that, you know. Oh, John, you're so lucky to have the Doc Media Centre, mate. Do you... <laughs> okay, let me describe to you luck. <laughs> it's, got... it's not the luck that you think you have, you know. It's, um, it comes from hard work, talking to people, being persistent, being resilient and stuff. And I think that's why people are drawn to the Doc Media Centre, because when they suddenly realise why you're doing it, it's not about money. It's about, um, you know, making... It's not even about making a difference, yeah? Because sometimes it's not about making a difference, changing the world. It's about making the difference because you're helping someone to change their own world. You know what I mean? Which is invariably, invariably, once they get over my threshold here, is an adjustment in their own thought processes and stuff. Let's think to the future. Where do you see oh, yourself go on in then. a year? <laughs> Let's think to the future. <laughs> Where do you see yourself in a year? Good grief. Where do I see myself in a year? Um, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, my, my, my <coughs> the completion of my first year as a permanent member of DMU, that'd be quite interesting, rather than being part-time hourly paid. That'd be, that'd be quite rare. Um, I'd like to think 
I'm at the point where I can really think about what I'm going to do with the Parallel Lives Network because it's been going sort of 18 months and that's long enough to make a decision about, you know, it will be 2022. So it's still sort of eight, eight years to 2030. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about it quite a lot, actually. 55 is a weird age. I thought you, you, I was meant to do this when I was 50. I got to 50 and I'm like, well, I, I didn't think I'd make it to 30. So I've had 20 extra years making it 50 is really cool. Um, but the kind of the reflection I thought that I would get at 50, I've kind of had at, at 55, really, because I think, you know, I, I think also I got, I got a letter through the post. Apparently, I've got a Sun Life pension that when I retire will pay me 90 pence a day, which is quite good, actually, because I do a lot of stuff in Southeast Asia where I could actually live on 90 pence a day. Well, maybe that's my beer and food. I just need to get another 90 <laughs> pence for somewhere to sleep. But you know, I, think quite, I think quite pragmatically like that, you know, quite realistically. So I think, you know, that, that 2030 for me is, you know, is a nice motivational thing to go for. Because I think, well, you know, by then I'll be like, you know, nearly 65. Um, yeah, it's weird. Very, it's very strange, mate. It's a, it's a very strange thing, actually, when you think about where you want to be, because... There's certain things that I do as a lecturer, you know, particularly running creative media entrepreneurship, because you probably remember week two that I've just done there, you know, what it was like. And you're saying things to people and there's there's people you're, you know, they've, you, you've got there, you've got them already because they want to be there. There's others that turn around and go, well, hang on, mate, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Give me a chance. I'm not awake yet. Um, and there's others that are like, well, I'm here because I've got nothing else to do. So as you well know, you, you, you know, you draw in and you get drawn to the ones that you know are, are there and that you're kind of, you know, preaching sort of converted, if you like. But it's still, I think, some of that stuff that you go through from, you know, this is what you should do. But you know, there's always part of me that wants to then say, this is what you should do if you want to. You know what I mean? Because life's not about this plan. You know, you've been through primary school to get to secondary school. You go through secondary school to get your GCSEs, which is for someone else because it's on their league tables. Then you go to college or sixth form. And then if you go and then if you do go to uni or an apprenticeship and stuff like that, and then you pop out the end and it's like, well, has anybody actually given you any good advice throughout that whole process beyond told you what you should do to get where you're going? No one's actually told you, you know, or asked you, where would you like to go? And we, we define it all by work titles or job titles or career choices and all that sort of stuff. But no one turns around and says, if you'd like to be happy, do you think this is the path that you should be taking? Mm -mm. If you'd like to spend more time <laughs> doing your hobbies, you know, would you like to spend Friday, Saturday and Sunday being who you are rather than being defined by what you do Monday to Thursday? And that's why I always try and encourage people you know, when they go into a room and it just looks like they're in this kind of, you know, round robin, suit and tie, business card, wielding, scanning up and down 30 seconds, can I sell to you bullshit that passes of networking most of the time. It, you turn out to say, someone, someone, so, excuse me, you know, what are you interested in? And they go like, uh, well, I work at, that's not why I asked you. I don't, care what, I don't care what your job title is, mate. I don't care what you do at work. What do you do outside work? Because that's who you are not what your job your job does not define you First, again a bit like the media telling you, you shouldn't shouldn't like for some reason work has been the thing that defines people you know what i mean are you on a zero hour contract oh you must be a terrible person are you a single mum you know what i mean that kind of stuff you know suddenly these things have been designed specifically to put people into pigeonholes um whereas if you turn around and say to someone you know what you what you're interested in and then someone described to you in great detail their commitment to looking after their neighbour who's poorly or working on an allotment or helping at the scout or cub group, you know what I mean, or the girl guides or, you know, working with girls groups or, you know, their knitting circle or, you know, singing in, singing in a band at church. It doesn't matter. When that person's doing that, that's who they are, not what they do during nine to five, Monday to Friday.